so um, it's, a, it's an honor and pleasure to be here. Um, like John said, I'm Paul Joachim. I'm a statistician with the National Institute on Drug Abuse. And um, I'm in the part of the Clinical Trials Network. The Clinical Trials Network, we do uh, kind of late phase effectiveness trials, um, sort of uh, multi-site trials in community treatment programs. And so, so I may show examples, not, maybe not today, but in future presentation, I may show examples of, of drug abuse. So if you see about, you know, trials, examples on drug abuse, then you know where they come from. Um, I'm going to do, I'm going to allow for questions during the talk. So I'm going to pause maybe at two places and, and pause and ask questions. I would love to hear your questions. Uh, I'm going to be bored talking for an hour and a half. Uh, so, so please ask questions. Um, the, the goal here is, you know, I'm going to show you st stat stuff, right? But the goal is really, I don't want to convert you to become statisticians. That's not my goal. I, I, I think you're pretty happy with what your profession, probably. Uh, I don't think you want to become a statistician. I'm guessing. I don't know. Uh, so my goal is not to make you turn into a becoming a statistician. Uh, actually, I'm not, my goal is not to teach you how to do the statistics. Uh, that's not my goal either, uh, because I truly believe that you should leave the statistical stuff to the statistician, uh, because it's becoming very deep field and very wide, wide and deep. There are many, many subfields of stat, and and you know I hear a lot of statisticians in the U.S. telling me, oh, you know this field of statistics is not my expertise. And you would think that, well, you have a PhD in statistics. You should know everything about statistics. That's not true. Um, there are now statisticians who are specialized in very, very narrow subfield of statistics. My point is a long story to say that, you know, yes, you can do the basic stuff, but if you have a little bit of complicated stuff, leave it to the statistician. So again, my, my goal is not to... To, to teach you how to do things. So what is the goal of the pre this presentation and the next three that I'll be doing over the next two, three days, is for you to understand the concept. So the intuition behind the statistical thinking. That's really the goal. So that when you talk to your statistician, you communicate better. You understand what, why are they asking this? Why do they need this information? What do you want to tell them? So that's really my goal, is to understand the intuition behind the concept so that you know how to speak. And it's good for the thinking about designing your own clinical trial. It, it, that helps you think in the way, a little bit, the way the statistician thinks. Okay, so it's a long introduction, but I, I felt I needed to tell you that. All right. So what I thought I would start, I have my notes here because I want to make sure I tell you the important stuff. I know I'm, I'm going to try not to read, I, I hope I won't, but just in case I forget something and I, it's important, I want to make sure I tell you that. So I thought I'll start with uh, sort of basic terminology, words that I'm going to use quite a bit. And again, if, if, if you think I'm speaking too fast, I'm using to technical terms, I'm using maybe American expressions that you're not familiar with, raise your card, or maybe the translators can, can tell me, you know, we don't know what you're talking about. So, so let, let me know. If you can't hear me because the microphone is too far, as, as you can see, I, I, I do this quite a bit. So, uh, so you tell me. It's important. I, I, I have lots of slides. I have Today is okay, but like next tomorrow I have like a hundred slides. I can go very quickly, but if you don't follow me, that's useless. So I'd rather that you know we go slow and you ask questions and we interact rather than go through a hundred slides and I'm I'm happy because I finished. That's not really important to me. Okay, so terminology. 
I thought I'll start with patient versus participant. And actually, this is a little bit what Christine alluded to yesterday. Uh, a patient is, is not the same as participant. I like to call a person, an individual who is part of a trial is a participant, not a patient. Because the goal of a patient is to treat the patient, to do the best thing for the patient. A participant is not, you don't do the best thing for the participant. You randomize and you say, you go to placebo. Well, you know. So, so patient is for the clinician, for, for medical goal. Participant is for a trial. So I'm going to use the words treatment arm, treatment intervention, uh, treatment condition, treatment group, intervention group, A, B. All these mean the same thing. So they're all the same thing, but I may kind of use one or the other. It's basically the, the assignment. Okay, that's basically what these, all these expressions mean. Treatment allocation is the actual assignment. So where they are assigned to, that's the allocation. Baseline pre-randomization characteristics and baseline factors. In clinical trials, randomization is a very important point in time, very important. Before randomization is one thing, and after randomization, it's another thing. So what baseline, and I'm going to talk more about this, but what baseline characteristics, whether you say baseline or pre-randomization, I like to say pre-randomization because it's very clear. Baseline, we don't know exactly where baseline is, but pre-randomization is everything, all the data you collect about the participant before randomization. And that's, that's, these are very different from the data you collect after randomization. And I'll talk about this more as we go. So, um, again, just as, as, as an introduction, I thought I would start by talking about some biases. And there is a selection bias. So selection bias is basically saying, well, you know, if, if, if I let the investigator, you know, a participant comes in and, you know, the investigator looks at the participant and says, okay, you look, yeah, I'm going to send you to placebo. Another one comes in, no, you look sick, you better go to the other arm. That's, that's very subjective, which means, you know, the person is not, every human being is not completely objective. They, they are consciously or subconsciously sort of making decision in their heads. So that's a selection bias. In other words, you know, we don't know exactly, we, we look at the person and decide, you don't want to do that in a clinical trial. So that's a selection bias. And the remedy, the solution to fix this is randomization. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Then there is investigator bias. Thank you. Investigator bias is, is basically now the investigator or the nurse or the practitioner or whoever is involved with the participant uh, knows what what intervention the participant is in. And basically is kind of biased, you know, if, uh, if they know, uh, you know, you're in a control group, um, they may say, oh, this is really not working, you know, and I, you know, I, I can see from these answers it's not working. So it's like re reinforcing yourself, you know, you, you think it shouldn't work and you make it so it doesn't work. Uh, or if they go into the intervention, oh yeah, the intervention is, must, be, must be really good. And so there is a bias, that's the point. There is a, you know, a, the, the mind kind of is, is tilts a little bit towards what it desires to. And the remedy, the solution is by masking. By, we talked about this, Laura Lee talked about it, blinding. Uh, so you want to blind uh, the investigator to, to the intervention. And then you have the participant who may be biased. If they know what they got, they may be biased. They say, well, I, of course it's not working because I was assigned to placebo. Of course it's not working. And I, feel, I still feel sick. Uh, but if you sign an intervention, oh, I, th I think this is good stuff. So, yeah, I feel good. Well, that's bias. 
And the remedy for that is, again, uh, masking, blinding the participant to the assignment that they got. Gold standard for evaluating new interventions. Okay, gold standard means the best thing you can possibly do that is still practical, so gold standard. Well, it's, it's the randomized controlled trial. That's the gold standard. Doesn't mean it's the only thing you can do, and, and Jerry talked about yesterday about epidemiological uh, studies, observational studies, but the gold standard is randomized clinical trials, controlled trials. And if possible, if you can add to that double blinding, that's, that's even a bonus, that's even better. So, that was my little introduction. Um, so this is a long outline, <laughs> uh, but I'm, I'm gonna go pretty fast over the first few and I'm gonna focus on how to randomize. I'm gonna spend more time on how to randomize. So, so but the, the before that is gonna go pretty fast. Um, am I doing okay? Am I in good speed? Okay, thank you. All right, so what is random? So each possible assignment is known. The chance of being assigned to uh, a particular group is known. The probability is known. Not, you don't know the assignment, but you have decided beforehand the chance of being in a certain group. So that's, that's number one. Which treatment condition is assigned is a result of chance. It's not, we could say, deterministic. No, it's not deterministic. It's a result of chance. So you know that we have half, half chance, but then you flip the coin and you assign the person to one arm. So it's a result of chance. And that's very important. Which treatment condition will be assigned is unpredictable. You don't want to, again, because of biases, potential biases, you don't want to be able to predict the assignment. You want the investigator to all, you don't want it to say, oh, this person is coming for inclusion, exclusion criteria, but I do know the next assignment is control. But this person looks sick, so therefore, I'm going to exclude this person for the trial. You don't want to be able to predict the next assignment. That's basically the point. So I'm going to give you, just for fun, a, an example, and I'm going to make the point I'm trying to make at the end of this example. But I, you know, I call it the mind versus the coin. And here's, here's the, the story. The story is you have one person is tossing a coin, and I put tossing in quotes. They're not really tossing a coin, they're tossing the coin in their head, okay? So you think of, oh yeah, first toss, and a and hundred times, okay? And you record the zeros and the ones, the heads and the tails, okay? So you do it hundred in your head. And then you have another person who's actually doing it, okay? Is actually has a coin, flips it a hundred times, and records, all right? So the mind toss, the one in the head, does it in the head, writes zeros and ones. And the other one, the coin toss, actually flips and writes every time. Okay. So, if, if you were, I mean, this is not, of course, it's not real data and all that, but it's, it's been done in classes by teachers and all that. But if you were to put the distributions of zeros and ones for the mind toss, you will get something like this, okay, not exact. Of course, the zeros and the ones are not gonna be exactly equal. I mean, you did it 100 times, you can't, you know, figure out 50 and 50 exactly, but it's gonna be rather equal. And if you look at the person actually tossing the coin, you will also something see. You'll see something roughly the same, uh, not exact, probably not exact, 50-50, but similar. Now here's, here's the interesting part. Now suppose we were to look at sequences of three. Okay, so you have a hundred zeros and ones, but you look at sequences of three. Okay? So how many possible, there are eight ways, eight possibilities. Statisticians love to count possibilities. And all that. 
So there are eight ways of doing this. And you, you can see them on the screen. Zero, 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 one, blah, 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 blah. So if you were to put the distribution of those sequences from the person who's actually doing the, the tossing, this is, again, it's rough. I mean, this is pretty much what you would see. And, and because all the sequences are equally likely. All one, each one of them, are, they're all equally likely. So the chance of getting this sequence, the first one, is one-eighth. The second one, one-eighth. Okay. But if you look at the distribution of the person who did it in their mind, this is what you would see. Because we think, you know, the chance of getting three zeros in a row is, is, is not, you know. So I'm going to, in my mind, I'm not going to allow to say zero, zero, zero. And I'm not going to allow in my mind to say one, one, one. I'm going to, you actually alternate zeros and ones more often than chance. Because you want to, you know, say, oh, no, no, I, you know. So you're going to say, well, what's the point of the story? The point of the story is that random, random is hard. Random is not something, you know, it's not the natural. We can't in our heads do things randomly. We can't, we really need computers, of course, a, a coin, but nobody uses coins. But, but we really need computers to do random assignments. And actually, I was surprised when I found out, it is very, very hard to write a program that generates random numbers. Very hard. Uh, and, and people test it. You can test whether the program is actually generating random numbers. So that's, that's the point of the story, is randomization, random numbers, random assignment is actually not a natural thing. You don't do it right just by thinking. You do need a computer. All right. So what is randomization? In the clinical trial context, randomization is a method based on known chance alone, known chance, by which eligible and consented participants are assigned to one of the study intervention. OK. I think that's, I hope this is pretty clear. OK. And like I was saying, the, par the participant's time of randomization is key. And I'm going to a little bit explain a little bit more about this. So like I was saying earlier, there is the pre-randomization, which we call baseline, and the post-randomization. Now, why is this key? Why is that so important? It is extremely important because everything you collect about the participant before randomization could not have been affected by the assignment. They don't know. We, nobody knows the assignment because you haven't done the flipping of the coin. So, so everything you collect before the randomization is completely unrelated to the treatment assignment. But the things you collect, the data, the information, the assessments, anything you can think of that you collect after randomization may be affected, doesn't have to be, but may be affected by the assignment. And then you can separate the two. And I'm going to mention this again and again and again. It's called confounding factors. And Laura Lee talked about that. Confounding factor is extremely important. What does it really mean? And I'm going to show you an example, is you can't separate. For example, what is an example of a baseline uh, information that you collect. Well, gender, age, demographics, severity of disease is still, I mean, even though it's clinical, it's not demographics, is also a pre-randomization baseline that you could collect. So anything you want to collect, blood pressure before randomization, uh, how many times have they used drugs in the past 30 days before randomization, all of these things are fine. You collect them and you can control for them in the model. But after you collect, after you randomize, it's a completely different story. And that the thing you know, that is very hard for investigator to, I don't want to say understand because that makes like investigators don't, don't understand. That's not what I mean. But it's very hard to, to grasp 
is they say treatment adherence. You know what treatment adherence is? You actually are actually taking the treatment. So it could be a pill, so whether it doesn't matter if it's placebo or, or a medication or, 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 two medi or two different medications that you're comparing, you want them to actually take the treatment, right? Because that's, that's what you want to test. Or if it is a psychosocial therapy, it doesn't have to be you know, a medication, if it's a psychosocial therapy, you want to make sure they attend all the sessions that they are supposed to attend. That's the treatment. So you do want them to take the treatment. But that's the perfect world, which we are not in the perfect world, which means especially for drug abusers, you know, they don't come to every session, they miss a lot of sessions. So, but then I get the investigators say, well, you know, if, if you don't take the pill, it's not going to help you. So therefore, what I would like to do, I, investigator, I would like to pick those who did take the, the pill more than 80% of the time, and then analyze those and ignore the others. What's wrong with that? Because, you know, if they didn't take the pills, how can I test whether the pill did them any good? Well, they didn't take it. So it's, the investigator is thinking, well, you know, it doesn't, help, it doesn't help, and I wouldn't know. But there is a huge problem with that, huge. Because what of confounding? What? What if they didn't take the pill because it made them sick? So the fact that they didn't take the pill and the actual treatment are confounded. They, they are together and you cannot separate them. You cannot, you know, the effect of the, the side effect of the pill from the effectiveness of the treatment, you cannot separate them. So that's what confounding is all about. So that's why the randomization is a key point. Okay, so this is something, I don't know, I mean, you know, please don't be offended, but I don't know how much you've seen these things. I just wanted to show you this notation that you may have seen, I, I don't know. You know, like when you see one-to-one, -one, it's a two-arm with equal chance of being assigned to each arm. One-to-one-to-one, um, -one -one, one, that tells you that you have three arms and equal chance, one-third, one-third, one-third. Is this, do I need to explain further, or is this pretty... Okay. And it, one to two, it means you have two interventions, but it is one-third chance to go to the first one and two-third chance to go. To, so these are odds. I don't know if you like to think in terms of odds, but there are odds. One-third goes to first treatment, two-thirds go to the second treatment, two interventions. And one to one to two, you've got three intervention, one-fourth, one-fourth, one-half. I just put this slide just to show you some notation that you may see or you have seen. It keeps the treatment allocation free from selection bias. We talked about selection bias. You don't want somebody deciding who to randomize or where, where to randomize, where to put the participant. You don't want that. You want a, you know, a, 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 a objective randomization. It balances intervention groups with respect to known and unknown. And this is very important known and unknown baseline characteristics that may influence the outcome. This is key. You know, there are also other things that you don't know that could influence the outcome. You don't know them, but with randomization, it balances those even though you don't know them. Okay? And it allows to attribute differences in outcomes to differences in the efficacy of the treatments under study. Randomization allows you to go from what I see is a difference between the two arms to actually be able to say, therefore, it's the treatment that was the cause. Because, well, you say, why? Something you cannot do in observational study because you haven't randomized. There could be unknown things that are going on and you wouldn't know. But with randomization, you say, I've balanced everything because of this objective randomization, except the only difference between these two groups are the treatment, the treatment assignment. So therefore, if I see an outcome that is different between the two treatment groups, therefore, I can say it's because of the treatment. 
And this is one of the rare, I don't know, I want to say the only time, but I'm not sure about that. It's one of the rare times you can make that implication. You can go from association to causality. So why randomize? You know, we talked about randomized controlled trials versus epidemiologic versus observational studies. Again, same story, the causation and, and confounding factors. It, it takes care of all the possible confounding factors. There's always a chance of imbalance, and we'll talk about this when we talk about reports. You, you show, we call it table one, with all the baseline characteristics to see if by chance there was imbalances, but that's, that's a different story. But, but you've basically, basically, especially if the sample size is large, when the sample size is large, it's even more likely that things are pretty much balanced. When the sample soil is small, there is a chance, by chance, not by randomization, that uh, the, there is imbalance. Yeah, please. Large. What's, what's large? The question is what's large? 107 is large, 106 is small. <laughs> you know, you, I don't think there is one statistician who's going to answer the question of how large is large, how small is small, what's a good sample size. I, I, I haven't heard a statistician. Of course, you're going to hear, it, it's, it's, it's a little bit of a cop-out. Cop-out means, you know, you don't want to, you're trying to avoid the question. Uh, it depends. Okay, all right. It depends. Thank you. And now, now I know. Um, what? But I can give you a sense. I mean, it, it, it really depends on how many factors, how it complicate, how much, what's the outcome, what's the variability, blah, 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 blah. But in general, to me, in my own mind, and you talk to do statisticians, they're going to give you two different points of view, two different opinions. But in general, to me, it, you know, and it depends on how many arms, if you're, the total sample size is 100, but you've got 15 arms, that's different from if you have two. But if you, to me, if you have 50 per arm, so if you have a two arm, so total sample size is 100, that's, that's a good number. But in early phase, I don't know, Laura Lee. <laughs> if, 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 if you got, and, and there are early phase trials, they have 20, 25 total. Some even smaller, no? Yeah. yeah, so even smaller. That's what I would call small. But yeah, plus or minus, with a confidence interval. Okay, so here's an example of a confounding factor, okay, because it's, it's hard, it's not natural, it's hard to think of confounding, it's, it's, it's a, I don't know, it, I, don't think it's, I don't think it's easy to think about confounding, but so I thought of putting a, an example. So you have a clinical trial with two sites. Site one is in Rio, it happens to be only for men, and it gets assigned treatment A. Site two is in Brasilia, happens to be only for women, and it gets assigned treatment B. Okay, we run the trial, and we found, conclusion, treatment B is better than treatment A. Okay, any factor confounded with treatment? Okay, now I'm asking the question, do we have microphones walking around or if you shout loud enough I can repeat your answer any factors confounded with treatment gender right because gender and treatment are going together you cannot separate it could be that treatment B is is good for women but treatment A would have been even better but you wouldn't know that Okay, so you can't separate the effect of the two. One more confounding factor. Location. Location. So, I mean, you know the two cities, I, you know, but I can imagine there are differences between them. So, so again, the two factors are the treatment and the location are together. You cannot separate them. You cannot separate their effect. That's, that's really the right way of saying it. You cannot separate their effect. That's what confounding is all about. Okay. 
whom and what to randomize. You can run, the most common is participants. You randomize participants, you, you have p people. Okay, that's the most common. But you could randomize also providers. You can randomize you know, a doctor or a nurse station or a clinic. Um, so, well, not a clinic, a provider. Let's talk about provider. So, so, for example, you have a clinic that has several doctors and you, so, you say to Dr. X, you know, we're gonna, you know, you're gonna do this kind of treatment, treatment A, and we say to Dr. Uh, y, in the same clinic, you're gonna do uh, treatment B. That's you randomize, and it's randomized, it's by chance. You're assigning the provider uh, a treatment. So that's one way. And then you can randomize a locality. So a hospital, a school, a community, you can, you can randomize that too. So these are the different, but again, the most common is the participant. And I'm, I'm thinking we're gonna talk more about this. So how to randomize? And this is really uh, the, the heart of the presentation, is how to do it. Uh, so I think it's a good time to pause and because the, the how to randomize, I'm gonna spend a little bit more time on that. Uh, maybe if you have any questions, any comments, any suggestions, anything you'd like, please. Do you prefer to use different providers for different treatments? Because this is a confounding uh, factor. To randomize different providers from different treatments. Yes. Well, you can do actually both. Uh, and we're gonna talk about the contamination. There are pros and cons. Uh, if you are in the same clinic and you randomize the provider within the same clinic, and we're gonna talk about this, there is a chance of what we call contamination, meaning doctors talk to each other or participants talk to each other from different doctors. So we call this contamination. Contamination means like one treatment is kind of you know, getting into the other treatment and then you don't have two separate treatments. So in a way, if you, if you are concerned with contamination, you know, for example, you know, um, I would say with a medication and a pill, uh, well, I don't know, I can't think of a contamination. But if it is psychosocial therapy, then yeah, you could have contamination. So if that's an issue and you're concerned about that, then you may randomize, but if you randomize all the providers in one clinic and all the providers in another clinic, then you are really randomizing the clinic. Am I answering your question? I'm not sure. I have a question. I was surprised to see in your definition of randomization, eligible and consented yeah. participants. Yeah. And it raised two questions in my mind. Uh-oh. One is, um, it, it seems although, you know, there may be a default for consent, there might be cases of research where randomization is included and for which consent creates a selection bias. A, a randomization that is actually done where consent, say that again? Where, where requiring consent might create a selection bias. Oh, absolutely. So I guess the question... Absolutely. So well, even question if they volunteer to come, even if they come and I say, okay, let's see if I'm eligible, even, be, even before that, right. there is a selection bias. Right. Even the clinical sites we use, you think the we randomly select the sites we do our trials? No. Of course not. We actually select the best one in the country. Well, well, if you select the best one in the country, obviously it's not a representative sample. Right. So there are all kinds of selection biases up to randomization, no question about it. But I guess I just want to make the point that I think it's possible that there are some types of research that include randomization where consent would not be required. Oh, well, you have to talk to Jerry. You're the expert in this. Uh, yeah. uh, While well, consent is not required, I, I, this is kind of a little bit is that what you're saying? Do randomization when sometimes w without the consent? Yeah, that's, that's beyond. I, you're the expert. I know. No, now, to go back to your first point, you're absolutely right. I mean, you know, to, you know statisticians assume, of course, I, I, at least me, of course they have to be eligible. Of course they have to be consented. That's not the stat stuff. So I don't need to put it on the slide. Uh, that's, that's really what it is, but of course, you're absolutely right. I mean, and, and 
to me it's a, it's a, it's a given but but you're right it should be explicitly stated uh, john you want to i just want to respond to the the question of randomization without consent um and this touches a little bit on what uh, laura lee commented on yesterday you can randomize institutions so there was an interesting study recently um where hospitals wanted to know if giving antibiotics when a patient went to an intensive care unit made a difference. And so they randomized hospitals uh, where in one hospital they gave no antibiotics and another they gave one antibiotic and a third they gave three antibiotics. And they didn't consent the patients yeah. and they were able to show quite quickly the three antibiotics made a big difference. Yeah, you know. we we talked. Jerry and I were talking on our long way from Washington D.C. We talked about we actually running a, a, a trial in the clinical trials network where we are randomizing hospitals in China, and the point was well, since we're randomizing hospitals, there is really no one is usual care, one is a little bit more than usual care. At least we think we want to find out if it works, and there was this this general thinking that. Well, because the hospital is randomized, we don't have to consent participants. What we're going to do is we're going to put posters on the wall of the hospitals instead, saying, if you're in this hospital, you know, you're autom I, I, I'm making up a little bit of a story. The, the poster is true, but what's in the poster, I, I don't remember exactly. But I was talking to Jerry about it. To me, but, but uh, you know, I'm not an ethics person, so, but to me, it doesn't make sense to say, oh, uh, uh, a person is randomized, then I need their consent. A hospital is randomized, then I don't need their consent. I, I, you don't agree with I me? Do agree. Okay. Not that simple. Yeah, I'm sure it's not that simple. Yeah, Laura Lee? So, while I agree with everybody's points, when I see the definition, what I would think about, and maybe this is what you were thinking about, is the times I see investigators not even determine eligibility, or they right. plan to consent and they have not yet consented, right. but the first thing they do is randomize somebody, right. and it turns out that person is not eligible for right. their study, they have no un interest in being in the study, right. and I think that is what you were trying right. to avoid in your definition. Right. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Actually, my very, very, very last slide is taken from the book. I don't know which chapter, so excuse me. But, but it's, it's a list of things, and one of the, on the list is don't randomize be, before you have all these in places. Yes. Just the last. Okay. Question. Last question, because I know Giselle, so I'll let her. Oh, but Andre, Andre had a question. Sorry, Giselle. Andre had a question. And then, and then we go to Giselle. Uh -huh. Uh, no, that's it. Of course, John has already addressed what yeah. I would say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, have, you can randomize by clusters, and then you have to, inf to have the informed consent afterwards, isn't it? I mean, if you randomize a city, and you may give the, the person, if it's a new intervention, the choice to be treated in this new intervention. But it's not, if it's not a new intervention, uh, I think that you were right. Uh, a poster may be enough. You're, you're right. If there's cluster randomization, you randomize first and then you consent. But you're randomizing the whole unit and then you, you, uh, yeah, and then you consent the participants. This is a, a little twist that I didn't think of. Giza. Hello. Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. <laughs> I'm singing. No. <laughs> uh, just the first uh, Christine's question. I understood that she asked if those who are not consenting to participate, they, yeah. they, if it would create a selection bias yeah. on, on the study. I would just to come back to this question. And the answer is yes, it yes. does. It does. Of course it does. Because the people who consent are different from the people who don't consent. If you're going to tell course, me how, I don't know how to answer but that. Would then. it affect the validity of the study or only the generally be, generability? Generally, hmm? Thank you. Generally. Okay. 
So is, is it a validity thing or is it a generalizability thing? Uh, I think it's valid as long as you state in your results that this is the procedure on how we got to this point. Uh, yeah. How can we do a randomized clinical trial without, cons well, okay, I'm getting into, but you know my point. My point is to, you know, it, what's, the, what's a better way? Uh, there is no better way. It, you, you've got to select clinics, you've got to select people, you've got to ask them to consent. So is this a selection bias? Yes. What are the biases? No idea. But yeah, there is a selection bias. So, okay. All right, h h how to randomize. I'm gonna start with how not to randomize. So, you say birth date, that, that's pretty random. Actually, it's not. So, don't use birth date. Don't use the last digit of the medical record number. Don't use odd even room numbers. And you may say, well, why not? What's, what's wrong with these things? Uh, you don't know. You don't know if there is a pattern. I mean, maybe in the hospital they put all the rich patients in, in the even rooms because they have windows, and they put the poor patients in the odd numbers which don't have windows. I, I'm, I don't know. This is silly. But, but you, you don't know. You don't know if there is a pattern, and that's really the, the point. You don't know if there is a pattern behind these things that, that then will create a bias. And then you would have a confounding. Room number versus treatment are confounded. I mean, it sounds silly, but, but you know, you, you, create, you create problems, basically. So don't use things like that. Okay, so that's really the heart of, the, of this presentation. I don't know how I'm doing with time. Okay, so we're going to talk about five methods. And, you know, let me know if, if again, if I'm going too, too fast. So simple randomization. Well, okay, so, so we're going to talk about simple randomization, permuted block randomization, stratified randomization, cluster randomization, and adaptive randomization. Okay, hopefully it's going to be okay. So simple randomization. Each participant is randomly assigned to a treatment with a known probability, we already talked about known chance, um, regardless of the treatment assignment of other participants. Okay, so every participant who comes in, you're starting from scratch, you're starting from zero. Okay, as if you didn't know anything of what happened before. That's called simple randomization. So, what is an example? Again, I always give this example of tossing coins. Statisticians love to toss coins, uh, but, but nobody does it in, in clinical trials. Uh, but just for the concept, you know, you toss a coin, if, if it's heads, if it's a zero, you send the person to a new intervention. If it is one tail, you send the person to the, the participant to the placebo control. That's simple, and then you start, the next participant comes in, and then you flip the coin again. You don't care what happened before, just, you know, you keep doing it with all the, very simple. How to implement randomization? Again, low tech, you toss a coin, nobody does it. So how exactly do people do it? It's, we use a computer programs, and for simple randomization and other randomizations, you can, there are even free uh, free online ways to um, to randomize. So you put your you know you put your your data. You how many arms? You know, samples have or you put the information that the program needs, and it would give you the assignments. So there are th things like that. And um, um, okay, so that's simple randomization. So what are the pros and what are the cons? The pros, it's very easy to understand. You can explain to just about anybody what is simple randomization, and it's simple to implement. Very simple stuff. But well, that's the pros, but there are cons. There could be, by chance, significant deviations from equal assignment. So what do I mean by that? So for example, we have a clinical trial with a sample size of 20, and we have a one-to-one. Two interventions equal 
assignment. So you do a simple randomization, and by chance, because remember, it doesn't look at what happened to the, all the others. Every person, every participant is a flip of a coin. So by chance, you could go 14 are assigned to treatment A and six are assigned to treatment B, by chance. You're gonna say, wow, I mean, what's, how likely is this to happen? I'm gonna tell you how likely it is to happen. The chance of getting a deviation from 50-50 that is as severe, and I'll explain this in a minute, or more severe than this one, is actually 12%. So it's one in every trial. Now what do I mean by as severe and more severe? That sounds complicated. Well, all it says is there is an imbalance, right? 14 and six. The chance of getting such an imbalance, or even a bigger imbalance, is one in eight. So it could happen. Now, I kind of fooled you because I'm using an, ex I didn't fool you, I'm kind of using something that makes my point. I'm using a low sample size, okay? When you have 100, the chance that things, you know, it's gonna get closer and closer to 50-50. But if you're doing an early phase trial, it could happen. And that's the uh, uh, con of, uh, uh, disadvantage. I mean, we say pros and cons. Disadvantage of simple randomization. Another disadvantage is that you could have imbalances in important baseline characteristics that could happen. So, so what do I mean by that? So we talked about Im imbalances in assignment. Now we're gonna talk about imbalances in, in baseline characteristics. So for example, we still have the 20 trial, one to one, and we do simple randomization. And Guess what, we get 10-10. 10 in treatment A, 10 in treatment B. We're very happy. But when we look a little bit closer, we see that we have eight males in, 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 in the new intervention and two females, and we have one male and nine females in the placebo, by chance, okay? So that's an imbalance in baseline characteristics. We have a perfect balance in terms of assignment, but we have an imbalance, and there is a solution for that, and I'm gonna talk about the solution for that. But I couldn't calculate what is the chance of getting something like this. I didn't know how to calculate, so I'm not gonna tell you. So permuted block randomization. So that's the second, uh, I'm gonna, of course there are a zillion methods to randomize. I'm gonna show you sort of at a high level, the, the big ones. So, so it, it may take a while to understand this, but bear with me. So every block of X, statistician, I have to use X. You should be thankful I'm not using Greek letters. I'm using at least X. So a, a block of X, uh, new participants are randomly and equally assigned to treatment A and B, and X is called the block size. That's where the name comes from. And I'm gonna tell you what the permuted comes from. But the block randomization is a block size of, so, so what am I talking about? Okay, so let's say, just to understand, that you have a block size of four. So you have decided that the block size is four. Okay, again, Statisticians like to do that. How many possible ways can you have A and B in a block of four? And these, there are six possibilities and they are in front of you, okay? So what you do is now you take the block, you, you randomly pick one of those six, and that's the assignments you're gonna give to the next four participants, okay? So you randomly pick one of those six possibilities and then, let's say you pick the very first one, A, A, B, B. So the next four that come in, that's the assignment they're gonna get. A, and then A, and then B, and then B. Now you say, why are we doing this? Well, because now think about it. After four participants, you have perfect balance. Right? You have perfect balance. Every four, you have perfect balance. You don't take any chance of, oh, I'm gonna have 14 and six. No, all you need is four, and, and then you go to the next. You pick another random one of those, 
Now remember, predictability is important. You don't want to stick to the same because then people are going to figure it out. So you want to switch. You want to keep, you know, doing statistician stuff. You know. so, so that's what block run. Pre permuted is this combinations. That's where the permuted word comes from. It's all possible permutations. So, the first issue with that is you've got known block size. Does everybody know the block size? Or is it blinded? Well, what's the problem if everybody knows the block size? Any guess? What's the problem if everybody knows the size of the block? Yes, maybe you probably could guess the next assignment treatment. You well, not probably. Because of you know the size of the block. Yeah. And you say, oh, it has been AA, so now you exactly. can only... Exactly. What if I know it's AAB? What's the fourth one? <laughs> right? So I can predict for sure. I mean, at the, you know, after 1A, I cannot predict. It could be A or B. But now, I even actually AA, right? If I see AA, then I know what the two next two are. They're BB. If I knew the block size. If I didn't know the block size, then of course I, don't, I can't predict. But if I knew the block size, and I know that the first are AA, then that's it. So that's why there is the whole issue about actually blinding, masking the block size. Then there is fixed block size versus random block size. You know, statisticians have to love to make things complicated. We, we, we want to keep our job secure, so we don't want to keep things simple. We want to complicate things. So now we came up with the idea of saying, okay, well, maybe we don't have to stick to one block size. We're going to have two block sizes, four and six. So now I'm picking the block size randomly, and once I pick the block size randomly, I pick the block randomly. So now I'm, I'm putting random on top of random, and I'm making almost impossible for the investigators or anybody else to know what's going on. And that's really the goal. The goal is that as an investigator, you say, you know what, I'm not gonna even try to predict because it is so unlikely that I'll be able to predict. I'm not gonna even bother about it. And that's actually the goal. And the general rule of thumb, well, it has to be, block size has to be greater than the number of interventions. Uh, you, you, if you think about it, I mean, it makes sense. So just to illustrate a little bit, let me, let me show you. So we have a one-to-one -one, uh, randomized trial, and we have a block size of four. If we had a block size of four, then it would look like AABB and all the possible permutations. If it was six, you would have three A's, three B's, and all possible permutation. Of course, the number of permutations uh, increase quite fast with the increase of the block size. Okay, and eight, same thing. But now, what if you had one to one to one? This is how the block size, the blocks would look like. So you have two A's, two B's, two C's, and all possible combinations. If it is one to two. Remember, now we have one-third chance. They would look like, like this, depending on the block size. So you put an A and two Bs in a, in a, in a, in a, a block of three, or A, A, B, 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 to make the probabilities correspond to your goal. So again, I'm showing you this just to give you a sense of how it works. And if you have three arms with these probabilities, uh, then it w they would look like this, which if you think about it, makes sense. I, I hope, yeah? Okay, okay. So with block randomization, now how, how does it work? You have a fixed block size of four. We talked about that, six possibilities. So the first 72 participants, they come in and, you know, you could do in different ways, at least two ways that I can think of. You say, okay, I'm going to use all possible permutation with the first 18, right? So this is what I'm going to use. So I start randomly, I mean, I put A, A, B, B, but it's, it's the whatever block that is randomly picked, and then all other possibilities after that. Remember, every letter is a person, but you're doing it in blocks. So 
I just picked 72 participants. That this is an example. Of course, it's just an example of how it would, it would look like. Or you can just continue to do all, you know, you, you pick a random block from the six possibilities, and that's what you're going to use next. Okay? And if you have a uh, random block size of four or six, now we allow for both, so you pick randomly the block size, and then once you pick the block size, you pick the block randomly. So it may look, it doesn't have to look like this, but it may look like this. Okay. Are you following me? Am I? Okay. So what are the pros and the cons? What are the advantages and disadvantages? So a perfect assignment balance is, is going to happen every X participants. So every, ev after four, you know, if your block size is four, you know you got two and two. So you're going to get a perfect balance after a very small number of participants, which is, you know, very attractive. And if you have a time effect, so if time influences outcome, there is some kind of a trend over time, what this does, it, it allows the balance to happen quickly. So you're not randomizing 10 in one arm and then a year later 10 in another arm, because then time and treatment are confounded. Here, after just four participants, you got perfect balance. So it happens also quickly, quickly in terms of number of participants and quickly in terms of time. The disadvantages in a fixed block size randomization, and we talked about this, if block size is known uh, and, assignment, and assignment are not masked, the assigned intervention is known for the last person. We talked about this. And this is not the case in random block size randomization. When you say it could be four, it could be six, then it's very hard to tell. Okay, now let's talk about stratified randomization. Stratification variable, or we call it stratification factor. It's an important baseline characteristic that may influence, okay, it may, we don't know, but it may influence or predict a participant outcome. We think that gender may have an effect on the treatment. So we say, in fancy words, there may be a treatment by gender interaction. May. So we want to make sure, just to be safe, that we're going to stratify, and I'm going to show you examples, we're going to stratify by gender. What does it mean? It means that we're going to make sure that the males are balanced in the two interventions and the females are balanced in the two interventions so that there is no gender treatment confounding factor. It's like the example. If all the women went to one treatment and all the men went to another treatment, we have a confounding effect. We cannot separate the two effects. So that's stratification. A strata are the different levels of the stratification variable. So we would say gender has two levels, two strata. So what do people stratify by? Well, it could be anything really, but, but typically, typically, uh, side, gender, age, demographic, anything demographic, social, economic status, uh, uh, severity of disease, if you have a condition. I mean, in drug abuse, we say, okay, you have a drug problem, but we want to separate, we want to stratify by also you have a comorbid alcoholic problem. So we want to put the, the, we want to make sure there is a balance between those, those who have both drug and alcohol problem are balanced on the two treatments, and those who don't have both, they only have a drug alone, are balanced in the two treatments. Because there could be something that if you also have an alcohol problem, other than an illicit drug, you may be different, and we don't want them all to be in one arm, because then we won't be able to separate them. Yeah, I know what you're saying. Let me repeat the question. Is it, is it better to do it up front as a stratification, or is, is, can you do it afterwards in the analysis you control for? I would say you do it before. You do it before. Um, and then you also put it in the analysis, and I'm going to mention that in a minute. Usually, not usually, I... This is my own thinking. I, know, I, mean, I don't know if other statisticians think differently, but I'm thinking 
if there is a stratification variable, gender, if I think gender may influence the outcome, I'm going to use stratification randomization because I want to balance, blah, 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 blah. Fine. But if it is an important variable that may influence outcome, why would I not put it in also in the model? You're going to say, but if it's balanced, you don't have to worry about it. Well, but what the, at the very least, at the very least, if it is a predictor of outcome, not of interest, but it is a predictor of outcome, you're going to reduce the variance of the error term. Now, okay, I'm getting complicated here. Well, basically what it means is now you re if you reduce the variance of the error term, you basically increase power. So the point is, if you think it's an important variable to use as a stratification variable, put it in the model. And site is something we, because we do multi-site in the clinical trial, we always put in the model site. If there is a site effect, if there is an effect, that's okay. All it says is sites are different. If there is a, now I'm getting into another lecture, but if there is a site by treatment interaction, then it's a different story. But if, here, here let's take gender, it's, it's easier. Gender. If there is a gender effect, women do less, whatever we're talking about, than men. That's a gender effect. But the question of interest is not whether, you know, it's like the site. It's okay. I mean, fine. The women do less or more of whatever we're measuring, the primary outcome, than men. But the question is, is the treatment effect, the difference between the two arms, the same for both genders? That's really what's of interest. If they're not, the gender effect by itself is not a big deal. But if the difference is different between the genders, now you have something more interesting to, to look into. That's another lecture, so I'm, I'm kind of, I don't want to get too much into that. So, so what, what does it mean to stratify? So how, how does it really work? Actually, it's very simple. It's, it's you do the randomization within each stratum. That's it. So you treat the men as it was a trial by itself, and you randomize, whatever method you were randomizing, you randomize them, just the men by themselves. And then you randomize just the women by themselves. And that's stratification. So all the balances are going to be for men, and all the balances are going to apply for women. So how to implement stratified randomization? Example, if you have a block randomization, block size of four, with stratification by site. Basically, it's like I was saying, it's exactly the same, but you do it at each site. You do the block randomization at each site separately. That's it. So if gender was a stratification variable, it's the same story. Okay? So what are the pros? Within each stratum, stratum is Latin, stratum, strata, okay, it's fancy. Uh, let's say males and females. Within each stratum, there is a balance between treatment groups. So there is as many men in treatment A as there are in treatment B. There are as many women in treatment A as there are in treatment B. That's the balance we're talking about. Do not confuse with there are as many men as women in treatment A and there are as many men and women in treatment B. There could be a lot more men in your trial than women. It doesn't mean that for each arm they're balanced. It means that the gender is balanced between the two treatment arms. So if, if you get it, good. If not, just you, you have the slides, think about it. it, it it's a, it's an, I was going to say it's an important distinction, but it's easy to confuse those two. It's not super important, but just. So what, is, what are the cons of uh, stratifying randomization? The disadvantages is that the number of cells can increase very rapidly with just a few stratification variables. And I'm going to explain this with an example. So you say, you ha oh, I, I, this sounds good. I like the stratification idea. OK, I'm going to use side, gender, age, and severity of disease. Uh, this, is, this is good stuff. 
The problem is, and I'm not using that many levels. I mean, you can see we have three sites, two gender levels, three age groups. We're not having 10 age groups and, and two, two severity, not even low, medium, high, just low and high. Just those very small numbers. But look at that, four stratification variables with very small number of levels. And you can see that now you have 36 combination of these possibilities, 36. And remember what I said earlier, you are randomizing each one individually. So those cells, we call them cells, it's the combination, each cell may not have enough people to randomize. So you run into this problem of, you know, you've got what we say very low or, or either empty cells, then there's nobody in this particular combination, or very low numbers, and it messes your randomization. So, What's the bottom line? The bottom line is you want to keep the number of certification variables and the levels of certification within a variable low. Okay, cluster randomization. This is taken from a book by Donner and Clark. By the way, I have lots of references in the slides at the bottom of each slide, and all the references are at the end of the slides. So you have the long reference. So uh, they say, the authors say, a cluster randomization trial is one in which intact social units, the whole thing, or clusters of individuals, rather than individuals themselves, are randomized to different intervention groups. We, we talked about this, so this is not the first time. And we said, you know, you could have a household, a neighborhood, a classroom, school, a work site, physician. And all these are possible uh, clusters. Now here where it comes a little bit tricky because the outcome measure is usually at the participant level. It doesn't have to be, but it's usually at the participant. Now you are randomizing clusters and you're analyzing participants and statisticians get a little bit nervous. So, but there are ways. There are ways to handle those. But, but just be aware that you are randomizing clusters, but you're analyzing participants. Now, it doesn't have to be. Like, for example, uh, you're interested in a program for a school. I know this is medical, but let, you're interested in a program for a school. So you assign, um, uh, you, you randomize schools and you, to, to three programs. And you say, okay, you, we randomize you. You're doing program A, program B, program C. But you're only interested, really, in the school performance. You're not interested you know, in each student performance. You're interested in the school performance. So in this case, the outcome is measured at the school level. And then you're fine. Everything is fine. The randomization is done at the school. The outcome is done at the school. And it's just like if the school was a person. No difference. But the sample size has to be just like if you had individuals, too. So it can become pretty big. Okay. So why cluster randomization instead of regular individual randomization? Why would we want to do that? Well, sometimes individual randomization may be impractical or impossible. So you, just, you can't randomize students in a school to different programs. So they're in the same class, they're in the same school, you're not going to randomize each, each student. You just can't do it. Cluster randomization avoids contamination, and we talked about that. Uh, contamination is when, you know, you have within the same unit both treatments, and they talk to each other, either the provider or the students or the, the uh, drug abusers. One is assigned to this program, the other one is assigned. How is it going? Oh, yeah, you know what? They give me this tip. Oh, yeah, you did this step. Yeah, and this is how they told me to do it. And they just happened to be in the other arm. And the other person who's in the treatment B is learning about treatment A. And that's what we call by contamination. So they could be this. So you want to avoid that, and therefore you do cluster randomization. And it could be just, you know, uh, convenient or economical. You know, it, it could be... You know, it's uh, more cost efficient to do cluster randomization. So practical stuff, I mean, how to implement cluster randomization. 
It's pretty much the same as individual randomization, except that the unit of randomization is the cluster. Not, not, not much different. The only thing with cluster randomization that you kind of has a little bit something we typically add, and this is what we did with the hospitals in China. That's exactly what we did. We had 20 hospitals in China, and before we were going to do hospital randomization, but before we did that, we kind of matched them. So what does it mean? Well, let's say uh, we match them by the size of the hospital, how many beds. So we say, okay, there is this hospital that has 200 beds, and then there's this hospital that has 210 beds, so we're going to match them. And then once they're matched, we're going to randomize them. So one is going to go to treatment A, one is going to go to treatment B. So we do a little bit of matching. Why are we doing this? So that by chance the big hospitals don't end up in one arm and the small hospitals, and by chance, they could. So we want to make sure we match them before we randomize. So there is this little thing to do. You don't have to, but it's a good idea. What are the, the pros? We talked about this. More feasible in some cases. Uh, whoops. It uh, avoids contamination. More convenient, less costly. What are the, the, the disadvantages, the cons? is the, the unit of analysis, and I mentioned about this, you know, if, if you know, the, the, the randomization is done on the cluster, the analysis is done on the participant, it's not the same unit. And, that, and if you say, well, the outcome is going to be done on the cluster, then you have a big sample size of clusters. The number of participants in each cluster, uh, you have to make sure you, you make equal number of participants in each, each cluster, or should you make them different? That's an issue to, to discuss. Intra-class or intra-cluster correlation coefficient is basically the correlation between the outcome within a cluster. Uh, I don't want to go too much into that, but that's basically what it is. I'll talk a little bit more about that in the sample size presentation. But so, this is something you need to have an idea about before you calculate sample size. So, so this is, all of this that I've talked is called, well, it's called, one way of calling it is fixed allocation algorithm. What does that mean? It means that you have decided up front that this is exactly how you're going to do randomization. I'm going to do stratified block randomization with two block size of four by six, and throughout the trial, that's exactly the plan, and we're going to stick to that plan. And then there is what's called adaptive method or dynamic allocation. And what this does, it's basically, as the trial is going, you look at what you, what's going on, and then you change things. You change randomization a little bit. As the trial is ongoing, so the plan changes as the trial is going on. So what are, what are examples? There is what's called minimization. So this is about baseline characteristics. So you don't do stratified randomized, uh, randomization, but you watch. You watch how the gender is being sent to the treatment arms. And if you start to see an imbalance, you correct for it in the randomization. You change the chance of a male going to treatment A. It's no longer half-half, because there are two males, too many males in treatment A, I'm gonna lower the probability of a next male going to treatment A. So you are tweaking the chances as you go with the trial. This is on baseline characteristics. And you can also make changes on the response of the uh, participants. So as the trial is going on, you watch the responses and you may actually maybe even drop an arm because the participants are not doing well. Or you may lower the probability of the arm. If you're doing a dose response, for example, an early phase trial, and you have placebo and let's say five doses, okay, you start by you know one-fifth to each or one-sixth to each uh, intervention. But as the trial is going on, you watch for the outcome. And the, the arm or the dose that's not doing well, 
it looks like it doesn't do well, you lower the probability of being assigned to that dose. And eventually, you may even drop the whole dose. So you are tweaking things as you go. But don't confuse, I mean, even the tweaking is a pre-specified plan. Okay, it's not being done, oh, you know, uh, I'll see what happens and I'll decide. No, even the tweaking is pre-specified. So you, you, you have a plan on how you're gonna tweak things. Tweak, you all know what tweak is? You change a little bit? Yeah, so that's, that's what, there is a plan. It's not, let's see how it goes. Adaptive randomization are difficult. They are complex. Uh, they need expertise and software. They're not simple. For minimization, baseline characteristics need to be quickly measured and enter into the database. Another thing is, you know, if you're gonna be t watching and tweaking, you better collect the data quickly to everything be ready for the next participants. So things have to happen fast with the minimization, and it's the same with response adaptive. You have to collect the outcome fast so you can make the changes, right? So the, the pros is you, you, can, you're, you're, you may be more efficient than stratified randomization when sample size is small. When sample size is small, you may be more efficient. With responsive adaptive allocation, you maximize the number of participants on the better treatment. So there is a little bit of a, of a maybe an ethical tweak to it, uh, ethical side of it. The cons, the implementation and statistical analysis are more complex. And just to give you a sense, the International Conference on Harmonization uh, withheld judgment on adaptive randomization. So I say, well, we're not sure. We're not gonna say it's good, we're not gonna say it's bad. We're th still thinking. So that gives you a sense that things are not that simple. The European Medicine Agency, um, the Committee of Proprietary Medical Products, actually strongly discourage its use. Except in pediatrics. Okay, thank you. I didn't know that. And our US FDA, the Federal uh, Drug Administration, our regulatory agency, uh, provided guidance on its use. My point of the slide is to say it's, this is not something that's universally agreed, adapted, liked, implemented. It's still, and we in the clinical trials network, we stay away from it. <laughs> so, okay. So we're gonna do miscellaneous points and then recommendation. That was the, the big chunk I think I'm okay with time, yeah, ten, it's 10 o'clock, so I'm okay. So, yeah, it's a good time to, we have till 10.30, right? It's a good time to pause and uh, answer questions, and um, if you're asleep, you're gonna wake up. Questions? Uh, my name is Tiziana, I'm from Salvador, and I wrote here, not to forget, so even knowing that uh, baseline factor may influence the outcomes, is there any magic number of sample size that makes you feel comfortable of not using the stratified randomization? I think what you're asking is, you know, with a large sample size, do I still need stratification? Yes. Or with a large sample size, we'll take care of it. I don't need to worry about it. But what do you call for large sample size? Mm. Again, I'm sorry. 272.5. No, uh, you're absolutely right. The larger the sample size, the less need for stratification. But the way I see it is, I don't know, maybe Laura Lee has a different, what's the, call, what's, what's the harm? What's the harm? I mean, you, of course, if you have too many, then you, you get into trouble, yes. Uh, and, and you may say, well, you can prioritize your stratification variable. You say, I have a feeling that age is going to be really important. Maybe not as much gender, but age is going to be very. Uh, in our trials, uh, severity of drug, as you may have guessed from my examples, is very important. You know, it, this treatment may work for the severe cases, or actually it could be the other way. This is, this, the severe cases are too severe for such a small treatment to work. We're gonna, now, you can exclude those in your eligibility criteria. That's another story, but, but my point is, what is my point? 
Um, the number. Yeah. The, 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 my point is um, you can prioritize your, your certification and then stop very quickly. Don't let a long list of randomization certification variables. So I'm going to make sort of miscellaneous points because I couldn't categorize it in anything meaningful, so just miscellaneous points. Threats to the integrity of randomization. Exclusion of participants from final statistical analysis. So yeah, I'm doing randomization, I'm fine, but I really don't want to include these people after, after randomization. I want to exclude them. Well, if you start playing with the individuals after randomization based on whatever, you start including, excluding, whatever, you weaken the, the whole point of randomization. That's basically it. It's almost like, I'm going to be good, I'm going to do randomization, but then I'm going to exclude participants, and that's going to basically say, you might as well not do randomization. Of course, I'm exaggerating a little bit. There is a continuum of acceptability, but, but that's basically... So, okay, um, large number of participants with missing primary outcome. That's also a threat to uh, the integrity of randomization. It weakens the whole point of randomization, and we have lots of those in our trials. And drug abusers are not going to be, you know, prompt and on time, and they'd rather not go. Okay, so these are threats. Okay, ITT versus per protocol. I assume you know about it, but ITT intention to treat, uh, you include all, Laura Lee mentioned ITT uh, yesterday, once randomized, analyzed, that's the gold standard. Every statistician that I know of will say you have to do ITT in the primary analysis. You start with ITT. You can do other things, secondary analysis, sensitivity analysis, you can do all kinds of things, and they are fine, but the ITT is really the primary. And per protocol, for example, and we talked about this, you decide in the protocol that I'm going to exclude uh, participants who took less, they, all, I'm going to include only those that take at least 80% of their medicine, or that came to the sessions sev at least 75%. I'm going to include those and exclude the others. You can do that. There's nothing wrong with it, but don't make it the primary, and it doesn't give you a definitive answer. That's key. Don't take it as a definitive answer. Take it as, you know, I, I have this discussion with the, with the investigators. I mean, they say, well, again, it, it's what I was talking earlier. Why, if they don't take the medicine, how, you know, it's not going to work. We know that. And the statistician is not saying don't do it. It's saying do, do it, put it in the primary manuscript, and I'm going to talk about this in the last presentation. Put it in the primary manuscript, but put the limitations. That's really the point. Also include the limitation, the limitation, that this is not a definitive answer. This is, it looks like those who took the medicine, it worked very well for them. But we're not sure because of potential confounding effects, blah, 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 blah. So it is suggestive for an next trial. Okay, let's uh, play a little bit. Is this a good randomization method? You create two groups of equal size, so participants are coming to the trial, and you put two groups, and then you randomize. You say, I've created two groups, equal size, this group, you toss the coin, okay, this group goes to A, this group goes to B. Is this a fine? No? It depends. <laughs> Good answer. It cannot be wrong if you say it depends. You're always right. Okay, is this a good randomization? Yes or no? What's yes in Portuguese or no? No. Well, why? Because the people who are you, you are creating the two groups, right? So right there, there is, uh, you know, I'm going to put all the men here and all the women here. I'm going to randomize. Yeah, well, yeah, you're randomizing, but you've created two groups, and we have no idea what went in your mind when you created those two groups. No, no good. Is this a good randomization method? You toss a coin to determine the first treatment assignment, so that's random, 
But then after that, you alternate. That's very nice because, you know, you're going to get equal for sure. Is this a good? No. Why not? Because what? Yes, you can predict. If you know anyone, anyone, doesn't have to be the first, at any point, if you know the assignment, then you know everything after that. Because you know they're alternating. Unless you don't know that they're alternating, but not, not a good idea. Is this a good randomization method? On Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays, you assign treatment A, and on Tuesday, Thursdays, and Saturdays, you assign treatment B. Why not? What's wrong with it? I mean, it's just any days of the week. Anybody want to give it a shot? Why? There By the way, I told Giselle to participate in... So, to make it lively. Thank you, Giselle. <laughs> well, uh, it could be some determinants of the day of the week. It could, Absolutely. Absolutely. There could be determinants of people who come to, to the hospital or clinic on those days. Absolutely. The people who come on Monday, who are free on Monday, may be very different from the people who are free on Saturday to come to the Drug clinic. Drug addicts. Huh? Drug addicts. Yeah, that's right. The weekend is. On weekends, I don't that's know, right. Maybe. That's right. For drug addiction, the weekend is uh, different. I don't want to say what happens, but it's different. Weekends or, or, or paydays. What if you know you get paid on Fridays? You know, it, all kinds of things, known and unknown. That's the key thing. Known and unknown. Randomization say whether you know what's going on or you don't know what's going on. Randomization will take care of it. Okay, question. What is the connection between randomization and predictability? So, okay, I, we talked about this. So, uh, one of the main goals of randomization is to prevent the ability to predict the next participant's treatment assignment. That's really uh, one of the goals. Not the goal, but one of the goals. That's the connection between the two. What's the connection between randomization and blinding? Okay, randomization protects from selection bias. We talked this very early on. Randomization protects from selection bias and blinding protects from clinician assessment bias and participant response bias. So if you don't know the assignment, you protect that. That's really the difference between the two, the, between randomization and blinding. What's the connection between randomization and intention to treat? The answer is, without intention to treat, the benefits of randomization are significantly weakened. Again, we talked about that. And we're going fast to those because we talked about all these things. What is the connection between randomization in a clinical trial and random sampling in for a survey? This is a little bit off topic, but I couldn't help it. What is the difference between randomization in a clinical trial and random sampling for a survey? One main goal of randomization in a clinical trial is to balance known and unknown baseline characteristics. We talked about that. For surveys, really the goal is of random sampling or random selection is to obtain a representative sample. So, again, yeah, I don't want to elaborate too much on this, but just sort of to get the difference between the two. What is the connection between randomization and equipoise? Okay, our ethicist. Randomization, at least that's my view. I didn't run it by big shot people. I should have talked to you. But uh, randomization is ethical as long as there is equipoise. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, yeah. Equ what is equipoise, that's the right? That's the question. Equipoise, <laughs> I, 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 I can't explain equipoise in front of Jerry and Christine. I feel like... Uh, Give it, I'm going to give it a shot. You correct me. Basic equipoise means that whether, let's say two arms, just for simplicity. We have assignment for two arms. You don't know. There is no clear evidence. You may have a hint. You may think. You may suspect. But you really don't know whether one is better than the other. You really don't. There's no evidence. There's no scientific evidence that one is better than the other. 
And that's, you, you have to have that before you do randomization. You, you, even if, if there's a, st well, now you get into what's a tiny evidence, what's small evidence, that's getting beyond. But the concept, the concept is you don't know for sure which one is better. What is the connection between randomization and statistical analysis? Uh, the data analysis, this is from a book from Friedman et al. Uh, the data analysis performed at the end of the study should reflect the randomization process actually performed. And I, I, mentioned, I mentioned this earlier that, you know, randomization and analysis have to match. That's basically what it says. Keep in mind, you can't say, I'm going to run randomize this way forget how I did it, and now it comes time for an analysis, I'm gonna ignore how it was randomized, and I'm gonna do it the thing I think is best to analyze. No, you have to keep in mind how it was randomized. And it's not done all the time. I mean, people do kind of separate them as they are completely independent, they're not. So for example, I talked about this, certification variables should be included in the statistical model. That's my personal opinion. I think most statisticians would agree. agree. Okay, recommendations, I think we're doing fine. Um, this is gonna go a little bit, I mean, it's not long. So for common randomization methods, uh, use a computer program or online tools. This is practical stuff, I'm giving you, uh, use, okay, so you say, well, you're giving us 15 ways of doing things, well, what's the best way, or what's, of course it depends, of course, but, but typically, you know, typically. Um, Permuted block randomization with small random block size, that's one. And for multi-site clinical trials, use site as a stratification variable. Um, do not use too many stratification variables, we talked about that. And unless necessary, avoid adaptive randomization methods. That's my personal, I don't think it's like written somewhere in, in that form, but that's just and you say, okay, for this is for common randomization methods. What about for complex randomization method? I've got an advice for you. <laughs> that's how it's just, that's it. This is my last slide. And this is what I mentioned earlier, and we're gonna go through the point that was made. So this is also from the book, uh, the, the textbook for this course. Um, and this, the, the whole list is from the book. Uh, make it possible to, rep implementation recommendation. Make it possible to reproduce the string of treatment assignments. So in other words, don't make it so that if somebody came, not that you, maybe they will, maybe they won't, but if somebody came and says, I would like to reproduce the way they were assigned, you can do that. So the sequence of assignment is reproducible. So in SAS, I know SAS, I don't know how many, in SAS you can put a seed to, for random generation, random number generation, you can put a seed or you can say whatever the time of the day is, just pick a seed. The seed is what triggers the randomization. The problem is if you, if you pick the seed and you program the seed, you can reproduce the randomization exactly the way it was done. So you can do it again and again and again. The seed is any number. I mean, you say one, two, three, four, five, six. That's okay. But, but the computer generates randomization based on what we call seed. My point is, the, 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 the whole point is make it so that you can rerun the randomization program and get the assignment that you actually use in your clinical trial. It's just good practice. What for? If somebody comes and say, you know, a regulatory agency come and says, you know, this looks funny, or was it really done properly? You can say, here's the program, you take it, you rerun it, and you're gonna see the exact assignment as what we did. That's basically it. It's just, it's not super duper important, but it is good practice, it's just good practice. And it's not hard to do. So if you have it in mind, if you know about it, you do it. Like I was saying, in SAS it's very easy to do one or the other, very easy. You can do one or you can do the other. So do it the right way. 
document randomization method used. So say it in the protocol, in your, in your design paper, maybe you don't have room in the primary manuscript, but in the design paper, document it. Uh, that's the point we were making. Put in place features that prevent treatment assignment until conditions for entry into the trial are fully satisfied. That's what we were talking about. So don't randomize too early. Just when it's the right time to randomize with after eligibility, uh, uh, collection of assessment, uh, consent, after all these are done, then you randomize. Because remember, once randomized, analyze. Uh, mask blind assignments to everyone, to everyone concerned. Make it difficult or impossible to predict future assignments for past part assignments. We've talked about this quite a bit. And put in place procedures for monitoring departures from established protocols. So you have a plan. The world is not perfect. Things don't happen always perfectly according to plan. Just have a documentation. You know, we couldn't help it. We had to do this. It's all documented, and that's why we had to change slightly plans. And it has happened with us. It has happened. That we found a mistake in random. This is really an actual trial, multi-million dollar, multi-site, blah, 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 blah. There was a, 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 a stratification error in the program, and we had to oop, adjust. Of course, correct the program, number one, and then see, you know, of course our data center became all, you know, did we do any harm in the sense of the analysis? Did we mess things up? So, you know, it's okay. It's okay to have an unforeseen thing, but, but document, document. This is what happened. Be completely transparent. This is what happened. It's a mistake. We made this mistake. We corrected it. We did the best we could, and we moved on. Thank you very much. And these, these are the references. So you've got uh, all the references that are mentioned in the slides are there. And we have 15 minutes for questions. I, ho I hope this was useful. Uh, if I understood right, you said that you can't uh, separate like like the the China example. the matching yeah matching, matching. yeah uh, suppose that you have two hospitals big hospitals, and you you match them and randomize them and suppose that uh, hospital A will be the treatment one and hospital B will be the treatment two but uh, if is there something in a hospital A I don't know such as uh, sanitary conditions are different you don't know and could interfere with the treatment? How can you imagine it? It's, it's really no different from individuals. And I'll explain. It's a little bit more serious with clusters because by this, this hospital being slightly different, the whole, all the patients are assigned to one treatment. But it's really no different than individual. individuals. Individuals, I've also things that you know or don't know that are different from others, but you say, because of my large sample size, because I'm randomizing, things will balance. So I'm making two points at the same time. So the, 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 the one point is that it's no different from individuals, but you're hoping if you have an enough number of hospitals, if you have 100 hospitals and you do the matching and you send them, uh, chances are things are going to balance. That's number one. Number two, you're right. We, there, the danger is a little bit uh, more uh, important with clusters because it's not just one person now that has this confounding effect. It's the whole hospital and everybody in it has that problem, uh, what problem has this characteristic that's different. Uh, so I guess it, it's, uh, it's, you know, it, it, it's better to randomized individuals, but if you can't, you just, uh, but the sample size, which, you know, the, the, how many hospitals you're going to randomize is going to be key, just like people. É, quando você fala na questão da randomização em blocos, é, uma das características que nós iremos perder, que infere qualidade para nossa pesquisa, é a, a questão do allocation concealment, não sei traduzir essa palavra, 
a location. É, mas assim, é, será que não seria, é, nós não poderíamos ser mais permissivos em usar é, a randomização por bloco, por blocos, em relação a alguma, algumas intervenções, por exemplo, cirurgia, que onde o cegamento é impossível e, e a gente não tem tanta perda de qualidade. Em relação a tratamento clínico versus placebo, nós perderíamos essa, essa questão, é porque ao, ao se alocar em blocos, a gente saberia para onde o, doente, o participante iria ser alocado. Então, seria um, um viés de, de seleção. Ok, first I want to make sure I understand. What you're saying is, what, what, what is the advantage of block randomization if you're not going to have blinding? Blinding, yeah. The, the block random, well, it, it, well, there is this balance that we talked about, and that, you know, whether you have blinding or not, it assures balance, okay? So, and it assures balance very quickly. So you have, you have that one advantage. I don't know, I'm trying to think of, you know, uh, what is it? It's a big advantage. That's what Laura Lee said. It's a big advantage. So you haven't lost that. Now, of course, you know the assignment, and, and, but that's another issue than the blocks randomization. The knowing of the assignment, that's a, a, an issue, a big issue, but it's a separate issue. Uh, but you haven't lost the, the, the short... Uh so the... You're trying to balance at baseline both the known and the unknown confounders. So right. while it does not help you with issues that could come up because they know the treatment assignment, it does provide a lot of protection at that allocation of the treatment assignment. And so that is what it gains you. And as Paul said, that's a large amount of, you know, balancing the unknown confounders or even the known ones, when you look at kind of that table one in publications, any differences you see between arms, you now know that's due to chance. And it's that element that that is due to chance that in fact is what provides the validity for a lot of the interpretation of the statistical hypotheses and the inference about them. O professor Paulo tinha, estava a falar sobre como fazer a randomização. É, explicou os métodos uh, dos computadores, não é? mas eu sei que existem métodos de, de tabelas. Agora não sei se estão sendo usados agora ou se estão fora do uso. Não sei, é, é isso eu quero ter uma explicação sobre isso. Can you tell me, and this is a, an, an, it's not a tricky question, can you tell me why are tables used instead of software? Because I, to me, in my world, but it could be different, I, it's not, doesn't seem like it's a big deal to use software. But can you tell me an example of why, you know, computers are not available or, or what, whatever it is, tell me why you would use a table and not a software? Well, I know there are tabelas, but como o professor não falou delas, então e foi isso que <laughs> exatamente. Okay. Yeah, no, I mean that's a, that's a, okay, that's a fair question. Yes, you're right. There are tables that would do randomization and they they would do assignment, but they're not really. You, I, mean, I don't know. I mean, in my world, again, I, I don't know. I mean, my, they're not used because also you look at the table. There is error. You're going to have to look at the table uh, and you assign and you put in the envelope. And again, maybe there is a practical reason to use a table over software, and that's why I was asking the question. But you're right. You're absolutely right. There are tables that do that. But to me, it seems like you're asking for, for problems. You're asking for errors and all, all kinds of issues. And, and, and software does it so much faster. And, and you know, we have phone, you know, you, the way it happens, just to give you a sense, in our trials, and it's not, you know, super duper in the US, it's, it's pretty, you know, fairly common, I think, is, is basically the participant comes in, and by phone, you know, the, 
you know, they enter information. So when gender, uh, press one, uh, if you're male, press two, and you know, you plug in the phone by phone, and then the phone gives the assignment and says package ABC or package one, two, three, five. And uh, so my, my point of all this is that, especially if you have a complex randomization approach, um, yeah, the computers do it. Of course, you, there is programming and there is thinking and all that behind the programs. But once you have done all that, they just do it like that. So to me, I, I don't see why you would use a table. That's my point. And that's why I was asking, you know, Maybe I, I don't know. Maybe I'm missing something. You know, I, but but you, you're right. You're, there is such tools. Is, is that okay? So uh, about the adaptive design, yeah. uh, how do you choose the right time point to interrupt your study and perform the first analysis? Okay. Well, you you you're you're talking about uh, different things. There is. Adaptive designs includes lots of things. And one of them is you decide on a time point and you do what we call an interim analysis and you look. And how you decide the point is, is, is an art, you know. There is a little bit of science, there is a little bit of art. I, I can tell you how we do it. But that's not what I was talking about. I was not talking about pausing the, the, pausing the trial or freezing the data and and, and then see how it's going, and then making changes. I was talking about participant by participant, as they're coming in, you, you tweak things. That's the adaptive randomization. What you're talking about is an adaptive design, and more specifically, an interim analysis. And the way we do it, just to be brief, is, is we say, you know, what's important is that by the time, it takes time, you have to freeze the data. You know what freezing the data, like deciding this is it. Analyze, run it by our data and safety monitoring board, decide what you're gonna do, and then say, oh yeah, let's go and let's not go. In many of our trials, by the time you do all this, the enrollment is complete. So there are practical reasons and there are statistical reasons. The more you do looks, we call it looks, interim analysis, the more, the more frequent they are, the more of a statistical penalty there is. Uh, so it's, it's, it's but, but that's interim analysis, that's not adaptive randomization. Okay, thank you very much, appreciate your time.